political and diplomatic friction defined the North American landscape during the decades preceding the French and Indian War. As early as 1699, Edward Randolph complained to the Board of Trade and Plantations that French control of the Mississippi threatened English settlers in North Carolina. He pessimistically advised them to return with their families to England or some other place where they may find safety and protection. French and Spanish Catholics lured local indigenous nations to attack English traders and farmers. Twenty years later, the North Carolina governor warned his superiors that Spain's presence in Florida jeopardized the colony. St. Augustine officials encouraged local tribes to harbor English rebels, felons, debtors, servants, and Negro slaves putting this government under the necessity of keeping a military force. He lamented the expenses of having to contain Spain's deliberate granting of asylum to colonial outcasts. These traders shared vital intelligence with England's enemies. The perils had spread into Ohio territory by the 1740s. The high demand for fur and access to the lucrative markets of the Caribbean by way of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers fueled the enmity. Benjamin Franklin designated where the waters of the Allegheny and Monongahala connected with the Ohio River prime real estate and warned if secured by France, it would unite her dominions over the Great Lakes with her possessions in Mississippi, hence cutting us off from the commerce and alliance with the Western Indians and making these nations prejudiced toward Britain. It would also provide the loose English people, our German servants and slaves, a place to escape to and increase French number and strength. French and Spanish presence in the British sphere of influence tempted Indians and colonial transgressors to terrorize the English frontier, but the defeat of the French would alleviate border conflicts and social unrest. North American reports to England revealed the common prejudice that France and Spain instigated, coaxed, and bribed Indians to serve their interest. Little is mentioned that French dominance depended on the agency of indigenous people. The Cherokee, Delaware, Iroquois, Miami, Shawnee, and other nations' self-interest shaped the French menace. If the British defeated the French in North America, they would still have to remain pragmatic in their diplomacy with Indian nations. Otherwise, whatever victory the British Empire gained against the French, Indian resistance would jeopardize. Economic, diplomatic, and political cooperation between Native Americans and the English determined the nature of British access in North America. French people trickled into New France. Strict travel regulations allowed only resolute Catholics and loyal subjects of the French king to settle its Atlantic possessions. News of harsh long winters and rocky soil in the vicinity of Montreal and Quebec made the poorest French peasants, regardless of their devotion to church and king, hesitant to surrender their meager European plots of land to farm the New World. Since agricultural pursuits appeared a dead end, the majority focused on commercial endeavors. Such undertakings remain risky. The government regulated the transactions of traders and severely limited the entrepreneurial activities of inhabitants. Illegal trade to bypass economic bureaucracies was common. Almost all French merchants zigzagged from legal to underground markets. Stories of hardships and failures reached France and hardened disinterest. 
The French population in the Americas barely grew. It started the 18th century at 25,000 and climbed to 65,000 by the end. The scant French communities in a foreign and inhospitable land encouraged settlers to build strong commercial, familial, and political bonds with indigenous people. These alliances lighten the negative economic and military effects of lacking French compatriots to share the burdens of colonization. French traders and missionaries worked hand in hand and gained proficient fluency in local languages and assimilated to native cultural traditions, avoiding as much as possible pushing French manners on their hosts. Nations naturally gravitated to these foreigners, who they perceived as the least intrusive. One Oneida chief praised the French for understanding, quote, Indian affairs better than the English. The French are more generous, and that draws the affection of the Indians from the English to them. Such magnanimity and empathy helped the French earn primary access to the fur trade. Even the Uruguay, who maneuvered the diplomatic path of neutrality and conflicts between Britain and France, lauded French assimilation. They admired that these settlers preserved their hunting grounds, having fixed himself in places we frequent only to supply our wants. French forts served like markets where indigenous people sold their buckskins, doe skins, furs, and other peltry, and purchased cloth, guns, powder, bullets, and ironware. Their fair prices drew natives toward French communities and allowed King Louis XIV and his successor, King Louis XV, to invest in the construction of Fort Toulouse in 1717, Fort Louisbourg in 1720, Fort Niagara in 1720, and Fort St. Frederick in 1731. These installations protected France's fur trade and its monopoly over the waterways that led to the Caribbean. French capacity to coexist with the distinctive ways of Amerindians added strength to the insubstantial number of subjects who defended the interest of the king. French settlers appeared easier. They preserved the land in its indigenous state. It is no surprise the English believed they deftly manipulated indigenous people. But if the indigenous people complied, it was for the conservation of their customs and lands. The English began the century with 250,000 people and reached 2.5 million by the 1750s. They deceived natives into sales, squatted on lands, cleared it, and allowed their livestock to feed on the fields indigenous people farmed. A Delaware complained about a Pennsylvania surveyor and speculator, quote, He keeps begging and plaguing us to give him some land, never gives us leave to treat upon anything till he wearies us out of our lives. The surveyor proposed that the Delaware sell him as much land as the Englishmen could walk in one day. The tracker the English hire ran and the Pennsylvanian surveyor appropriated more territory than what the Delaware agreed to trade. This was the walking purchase of 1836, the most infamous of English swindles. English colonists feared this overpopulation of their colonies. They predicted it would perpetuate poverty and trigger social crises like they had back home. God provided the territory beyond the Appalachians to minimize this pressure. There lay fertile dirt to plow and economic opportunities for individuals who could not afford the dear real estate on the Atlantic seaboard. Benjamin Franklin enthusiastically promulgated how the greatness of the British Empire depended on its access to the frontier. It would allow English families to be self-sufficient for generations and avoid the destitution that plagued English tenants. Indigenous people discerned this threat. A delegate for the Delaware protested. The English, quote, in order to get their lands, drive natives as far from them as possible, nor seem to care what becomes of them, provided they can get them removed out of the way of their present settlement. 
English immigrants squeeze natives out by transforming the geography and disrupting their hunter-gatherer economies. A Uruguay leader criticized the English because no sooner they get possession of a country than the game is forced to leave it. The trees fall down before them. The earth becomes bare. Indigenous nations appealed and implored English colonial leaders to arrest the populating of Indian country. But authorities usually turn to economic and religious justifications. The English mentality was that savages failed to be productive and just subsisted on the land. A Puritan minister affirmed that the space natives inhabited was vacuum docilium, meaning that they were lazy and made no fruitful use of their possessions. Thus, the territory in question was theoretically vacant for English occupation. Religion validated this economic logic. English colonists followed God's law, which mandated they farm and create surplus. Quote, it is our dwelling on it and our improvement that have made it to be of worth, an official bragged. Farming spooked the animals natives hunted. Without food, resources, and lacking immunities to European diseases, tribal populations diminished. Anglo settlers celebrated the demise as a blessing. A North Carolina governor related it, quote, pleased Almighty God to send unusual sicknesses among them, as the smallpox, etc., to lessen their numbers. A minister marked the few miserable remainders of Indians left are as monuments of the anger of a righteous God and for our warning and instruction. As long as the English prospered, they would sustain God's blessings. So the English, in comparison to the Spaniard, have but little Indian blood to answer for. There is pride here that the English achieved what the French and Spanish could not. They segregated white pioneers from the heathen Indians. They also viewed themselves as superior to the Spanish because, quote, our cruelty is not the instrument of native deaths. Instead, it pleases God to send, boasted one leader, as I may say, an Assyrian angel to do it himself. The English ardently convinced themselves that the land they stole and the people they killed were predetermined to lose their land and die. Colonial assemblies struggled to regulate and centralize the speculating and buying of Indian territory. Authorities oppose settlers of the lower sort of people who are exceedingly loose and ungovernable. Squatters provoked financial and military conflicts. One Uruguay reminded the English, quote, For all we kill goes to you, and you have the profit of all the skins. Land stealing incentivized indigenous traders to sell their furs elsewhere. The Delaware, Uruguay, Miami, and Shawnee had recourse in provincial assemblies who cared about profits and shrewdly interceded to avoid the alienation of these people. Yet factionalism within these colonial governments, like the tensions between Pennsylvania Quakers and land speculators, made the resolution of disputes inexpedient. Quakers prescribed pacifist means to remedy the strife between the Delaware and the frontier people. They sympathized with the Delaware who protested their loss of land. As the Delaware warred against border communities in Pennsylvania, John Churchman, a Quaker minister, blamed, quote, the dead bodies and the outcry of the people on the sins of the English. The Lord had suffered this calamity and scourge to come upon them. The Quakers' opponents in the Pennsylvania Assembly refused to parley with the Delaware. At the end, the Quaker strategy delivered peace, but the lack of consensus within the provincial government led one Englishman to gripe. Such internal friction is throwing all our schemes into confusion and must naturally give the Uruguay, the Six Nations, such impressions and the French such advantages to work on against us that I tremble for the consequences. The French did not always manipulate indigenous people to war on the British. Many times the English themselves perpetuated these conflicts by alienating local people and animating their diplomatic relations with New France. 
Discord between tribes like the Iroquois and Delaware further complicated territorial contests. The Iroquois asserted they alone had the right to sell lands on behalf of the Ohio nations. A Iroquois delegate reminded the Delaware, You are our women. Our forefathers made you so, and put a petticoat on you and charge you to be true to us and lie with no other man. The language was purposefully derogatory, to belittle the Delaware and propound Iroquois macho authority. Delaware allegations of Pennsylvanian land fraud humiliated the Iroquois who had brokered these transactions. To make matters worse, in the chaos of the French and Indian War, the Delaware partnered with the French and retaliated against Pennsylvania by harassing, kidnapping, and murdering settlers. The Iroquois called out this infidelity and claimed the Delaware people were but a common whore. The Delaware conceded to the Iroquois' affirmation of masculinity by deceitfully confessing their attacks on the Pennsylvanian frontier were on Iroquois orders. One Delaware delegate wrote a Pennsylvania official, quote, "'Tis true, we are not at our own command, but under the direction of the six nations. We are women. Our uncle must say what we must do. He has the hatchet, and we must do as he says." Such diplomatic double-dealing confirms indigenous nations looked to fulfill their own self-interests. It also demonstrates that lack of consensus and factionalism on multiple levels delegitimize and trivialize grievances. British militarization lay on the Atlantic. Britain's defense budget for the Royal Navy tripled in the period between 1680 and 1780. The conclusion of King George's War proved the benefits of this investment. In 1748, England secured the North Atlantic and blockaded imports into Quebec. On the continent, natives never felt this threat directly. Instead, the peril was incidental, as the short supply of merchandise and the increased cost of transportation ballooned the prices of French goods. Certain factions of the Delaware, Uruguay, Miami, and Shawnee grew weary of the added expenses. They turned to English colonists who peddled better deals. Competition drew all these interests into the three forks of the Ohio, the area of modern-day Pittsburgh by the 1750s. While indigenous Americans preferred the empire of cards the French built, the cheap wares of English traders called them. Such were the irreconcilable alternatives faced as the French and Indian War neared. Pressed by British and French rivalry, native people skated in and out of alliances in accordance with their self-interest. Amerindians were adept at studying the differences between Europeans. They sized them down and utilized the knowledge to better navigate and manipulate diplomatic relations. Nevertheless, it was complicated circumstances. The militarization of France by fortifying their North American frontier and that of Britain by strengthening its navy was a function of the mercantilist economic system. European monarchies drained their treasuries for the construction of installations, production of equipment, and the professionalization of armies because first, they distrusted mercenaries and pirates. The age of legitimate piracy was gone. Now they enlisted compatriots and paid for their training, their feeding, clothing, arming, and housing. This assured loyalty. Second, they consumed all the wealth their empires produced to secure and expand further their empires because mercantilist economists prophesied the scarcity of wealth and natural resources. In anticipation of this global catastrophe, England, France, and Spain spread internationally. To thrive, economists contended. They had to maximize exports and minimize imports. This required Britain to access diverse climatic and geographic regions to retrieve a wide range of natural resources, the raw materials to produce all the finished products that English men and women required. The professionalization of the military 
and the militarization of European empires was a reality of mercantilism. By the 18th century, France and Britain chafed against one another at different points globally. Motivated by the idea of limited resources, European monarchies assumed the, assume the inevitability of war. Since economic success depended on depriving other powers of their imperial possessions. The embargo of New France demonstrated that native loyalty was conditional. The Miami switched sides as the British Navy tightened the knot on French commerce. This disheartened the French, who retaliated against what they called treachery without comprehending that the ends the Miami sought had never changed. It was only that the French means to Miami sovereignty had failed. The deterioration of French-Miami relations spoiled Uruguay-Miami relations, not because of Uruguay fidelity to France, but because the Miami put into question the Uruguay right to broker deals between indigenous people and Europeans. So-called subordinate female nations, like the Miami, evaded the interposition of the Uruguay. The Miami opened negotiations with Pennsylvania, undermining established treaties. Such multifaceted diplomacy triggered confusion and in some cases nursed resentment and hostility even between English colonies like Pennsylvania and Virginia, whose colonial assemblies also veed for control over the Ohio. In the case of the French, who wailed at the personal offense of being double-crossed, they sent their Amerindian allies to assassinate the leader of the pro-British Miami faction. The defeat and departure of the Miami created internal dissension within the Uruguay as a subgroup of the nation turned to Virginian land speculators. In the early 18th century, the Uruguay strived for neutrality in the conflicts afflicting France and Britain. This policy would help them preserve trade with the other Western tribes and avoid unnecessary warfare. The Uruguay intended to broker access to markets where Europeans paid the highest prices for furs and sold the goods indigenous people consumed at the lowest costs. This tactic, they hoped, would enhance Uruguay authority. By the 1750s, the English were best positioned to buy at top dollar and sell low, but they insisted the Uruguay side with Britain unconditionally. Neutrality became a balancing act that nourished mistrust from Europeans and regularly instigated internal political disagreements. Some Uruguay, influenced by Jesuit missionaries, for example, remain Francophiles. Such lack of consensus over strategy revealed the ultimate weakness of the Uruguay Confederacy. Nevertheless, the ends of neutrality were always indigenous control of Indian territory. The embargo on New France provided some initial advantages to Britain. Tanagrisson, who the English called the Half-King, befriended Virginian speculators and sold them land. The Ohio Company purchased 500,000 acres and contracted a 21-year-old George Washington to survey the land, secure Uruguay alliance, and expel French interlopers. By this transaction, Tanagrisson hoped to absorb and exhaust Britain's and France's military economic power. He calculated the British would be less problematic if embroiled with France. The intensification of European competition intersected with Native American designs to contain the ravenous appetite of imperialism. Tanagresson improvised with the Uruguay policy of neutrality to gain leverage for his people. He sold land to Virginia that the French contended they possessed. In May of 1754, Washington and some 100 men crossed the Appalachians to complete the building of Trent's Fort. Tanagresson alerted Washington's regiment that the French had attacked the English at the construction site and forced a surrender. He warned also that a group of Frenchmen camped nearby planned to ambush Virginian forces. French authorities contradicted Tanagrisson's allegations and contended that the delegation led, led by Joseph Calhoun de Vieux's Lumenville had orders to negotiate a peaceful English evacuation. The English considered these trespassers spies. Under 
Tanagrasen's guidance, Washington marched against the French and killed 10 soldiers, including the party's commander, Lumenville. The Iroquois, under Washington's naive command, scalped the French soldiers, decapitating one body and placing his head on a pike. News of this barbaric attack outraged the French, who viewed it as a provocation. The French government ordered Britain to punish Washington and the Virginians to evacuate the Ohio Valley. French claims on the Ohio Valley demonstrated disdain for Native American sovereignty. Yet, Tanagrasen's assault served as a reminder that indigenous favor shaped European presence in the Ohio. The Iroquois esteem for the French was not insincere, but it is evident that Tanagrasen conceived such alliances should promote Iroquois political independence and economic security. The English and the French disputed land boundaries that neither side possessed. A Delaware wondered, quote, where the Indians' land lay when the French claimed all the land on one side, the river Ohio, and the English on the other side. But European powers competed for more than just territory. They struggled for the hearts and minds of the people who inhabited this land. That Washington recognized he depended on Tanagrasen's advice and support seems doubtful. The half-king criticized Washington for treating Indians as his slaves and would have them every day out scouting and attacking the enemy by themselves. Washington failed to provide gifts to his allies and rejected their advice. Tanagrasen's actions were of a man in his 40s, a seasoned diplomat who had the attention of a juvenile Washington at his disposal. Tanagrasen intended to use the English as he discerned they used him. Evidence of Washington's inexperience came some weeks later when the French manipulated him to confess to Lumenville's murder. Forces beyond his control pulled Washington who lacked the maturity of his later years. Before the British could earn any substantial terrain, the English had to contend with their biases. The scalping and execution of Lumenville delivered war to North America. The English colonies with their Indian allies geared to expel the French, but the influence and power the Delaware, Iroquois, and Shawnee wielded appeared insignificant in contrast to the professional armies Britain fielded. General Edward Braddock arrived in North America in 1755, and fresh off the boat, he refused to meet with local tribes, ignored their advice, and ostracized their families from military camps. The first time a professional British officer interacted with indigenous people, he concluded, quote, I take them Indians to be the most ignorant people as to the knowledge of the world and other things. Military success depended on English assurances that they would respect native self-determination. Instead, Braddock smugly asserted, quote, no savage should inherit the land. British allies drew away. In the first battle of the French and Indian War, the French, guided by the Delaware and Shawnee, butchered the English. One chief blamed General Braddock's, quote, pride and arrogance for his defeat. We often endeavored to advise him, and to tell him of the danger he was in with his soldiers. But he never appeared pleased with us. He looked upon us as dogs. Enemies shot General Braddock from his horse. He died some days later. In the thick forest of the Ohio, Britain's professional armies failed both militarily and diplomatically. Even backcountry Virginians scornfully objected, quote, to any officers which might hereafter be sent over if they behave like General Braddock. Had we been a people conquered and enslaved, a polite and generous conqueror would have treated us with less rudeness and insolence than the gentleman Braddock hinted at. The English learned to modify or at least hide their prejudices. After the material and human waste instigated by the ethnic biases of gentlemen like General Braddock, Washington admitted, quote, I cannot conceive the best white men to be equal to them, the Indians in the woods. General John Forbes, who took over for the slain Braddock, agreed. 
He cooperated with the Cherokee and the Delaware because, quote, in this country, we must comply and learn the art of war from enemy Indians or anything else who have seen the country and war carried on in it. This authentic respect for their allies' expertise and territorial demands generated loyalty in Indian country. A Cherokee vowed to the English, quote, We are warriors, and our nations have lifted their axe against the French and are determined not to lay it down while there is a man among us left alive. We will make war upon the Ohio and spare neither French nor their Indians if they fall in our way. The hatchet we began with was but a small one but we hope to get one of a larger size. It was English esteem that grew this Cherokee hatchet. Not all English colonists considered these lessons as having long-term justifications. Many cooperated as a mean to defeat the French and pacify disgruntled and distrustful allies. The veneer of respect cracked as victory against the French approached. Some Indians foresaw this duplicity. A frontier trader reported as early as 1758, quote, The whole of the Ohio Indians imagined that the Virginians and the French intend to divide the land between them. The Delaware suspected that the only reason the English and the French battled in Indian territory instead of in the old country where the Europeans had settled was to waste the Indians. This confirms the sophistication and emotional maturity of the indigenous individuals engaged in diplomatic transactions. They conceded that alliances with Europeans were battles in a war fought at a higher dimension than the war between the British and French that pitched the white against the red man. In such a delicate exchange of ideas and favors, partnerships between Native people and the white devils proved the innocence of specific nations like the Cherokee, Delaware, Uruguay, and Shawnee, and the deceitful characters of the English who connived their way through treaties. Thus, evidence of English double-dealing helped establish intertribal camaraderie and a sense of Amerindian pan-nationalism in the face of a European invasion. Propaganda that, quote, the English sought to become masters of all and would put us all to death bridged ethnic differences that were part of the traditional ways of the past, but now, in the present of the mid-18th century, threatened Indian survival. The Board of Trade and Plantations defended the deals they made with Native nations. The Treaty of Easton, 1758, obligated Parliament to arrest English immigration into the Ohio. Their compliance with this agreement signified Parliament's recognition that British security depended on English respect for the territorial claims of indigenous people. At the end of the French and Indian War, Parliament solidified its promises with the Proclamation of 1763. Its legal consequences was British acknowledgement, at least for the time being, of the authority that indigenous people had in the region. The treaty that calmed the Indians laid the seed for an English civil war. The Ohio Company and the Virginia Assembly contended this was land the British had preserved against French occupation for Virginia to populate. Speculators interpreted the secession of settlement in the Ohio as a surrender of their business interest. The proclamation of 1763 instigated disputes between Virginia and Parliament, who colonists accused of dictatorial tendencies. The lessons of the French and Indian War were not lost on everyone. The strife between European empires and indigenous nations influenced a Muncie chief to reject diplomatic gifts from Pennsylvanian officials. He rejected the offering on political grounds. Quote, it would raise a jealousy in the breast of those who round about me, who transact the public business, that is, are the official diplomats, and are wont to receive presents on such occasions. It would moreover be apt to corrupt my own mind and make me proud, and other would think I wanted to be a great man, which is not the case. The colonists thirst too much after wealth to allow Parliament to represent it in Indian country. Like the Ohio caused war between the English and the French, it divided the colonies from its mother country. The Muncie chief demonstrated more diplomatic wit. One English contemporary observed the French, quote, enjoy the friendship of the Indians because they, quote, 
use the means in their power to draw as many into their alliance as possible and to secure their affections, invite as many as can to come and live near them, to make their towns as near the French settlements as they can. Native American preference for the French remained concealed from English consciousness. After Britain expelled the French, despite the loud, rabble-rousing damnation of king and parliament by colonists angry at the latter's tyrannical dictates on the frontier, the colonists remained fundamentally British in their inability to concede indigenous agency. It was tribal volition that propelled natives to the French, and after 1763 to the British government, Americans made native nations the Achilles heel of their diplomacy.